good day, radio listeners. Welcome to this edition of the Pure Sex Radio broadcast. We're glad to have you here with us. My name is Jonathan, and we have a uh, very special guest on the line with us. He's actually on the phone with us. We have uh, we have Jerry Sinclair from uh, all the way from Jacksonville, Florida. So, Jerry, welcome to the program. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Jonathan. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, so before we jump in to all the things that we want to talk with uh, Jerry about, I want to uh, let you listeners know uh, about our kind of our resource platform. It's the area of our ministry in which we connect with all kinds of resources, whether it be intensives or groups or counselors or books, and it's our pure community um, uh division of our ministry and and so if you are looking for resources whether you are a man struggling a woman struggling you have an issues in your marriage or maybe you're a parent with your kids and you're just trying to understand how to what are the resources that are out there that can help you navigate all of those various situations simply go to purecommunity.org and you can learn more about all the various resources that we are connected with well, Jerry, I would love to have our listeners just kind of get to know you. So I would love for you to just be able to tell our listeners, you know, kind of your story, uh, where you've come from in terms of your background of sexual brokenness, and then really just kind of how, how God uh, has led you into the ministry that you're currently doing. I'll be glad to do that, Jonathan. Uh, I always like to start with uh, when I crashed or when uh, I was totally exposed uh, with my sexual sin. And uh, that was on September the 13th, 1994. I had been working for a major national, uh, soon to be international, athletic ministry. Uh, I was kind of the backroom technician and in charge of a lot of different projects and uh, also chief fundraiser. Had a lot of duties. The director loved to do ministry and uh, minister to young people and adults. And so that was his gig, and I just kind of supported that in, a couple, in several different realms. And this is all before the Internet, but he called me into his office on September the 13th, 1994, and um, uh, said, Jerry, we found out you've uh, been unfaithful to your wife, and you're fired. Mm. And uh, it may not have been quite that blunt, but uh, I got the message loud and clear, and we prayed, and I packed up my stuff, and I left, and I went straight to my pastor, went to the sanctuary of the church, and told my pastor everything. I started when I was eight years old, was I, when I say everything. Eight years old, I was reduced to pornography then and uh, became addicted at that moment, actually, that mm-hmm. knowing that at the time. But it, through a, a lot of counseling and uh, clinical uh, background, we, we've really determined that my age onset at age eight was also my addiction onset. And uh, so uh, a little background or story about this. Uh, one of the kids in the neighborhood said, uh, showed me his dad's stash. And that's where we usually are exposed to it, either our own father or somebody else's dad has a stash and of, of uh, particular magazines of, of ill repute, as you might call them. Mm-hmm. So um, I looked at those pictures, and I was excited with them, but I also wanted to go out and play Cowboys and Indians. I really didn't want to be sitting there looking at those pictures at that point out of either embarrassment or uh, shame or different uh, feelings. But the the little, the uh, little boy, my friend, got called away by his parents who would go out to dinner with friends, and he had to go with them. And they happened to leave the garage door open. So I went back for a second look, and that was my first sin. That was lust. Previously, when I was introduced to it a few hours earlier, that's okay. It's not certainly unacceptable. But uh, that was that was shown to me. It was given to me. But I went back for that look, that second look, and that was lust. <clears throat> I looked at that stack of Playboy magazines, and I said, He's not going to miss this magazine. He's got plenty of other magazines like that. So I stole his magazine. And then I went home and I concealed my, the magazine that I had stolen from my parents. And then my parents found it and exposed me right there and, and called me out on it and, uh, and probably handled it as best they could. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I, of course, lied. I said, I don't know where that came from. Well, I was the only child. My dad just got home from work. So <laughs> I was exposed right off. But I want to point out to you, there were four distinct sins there that an eight-year-old boy committed. He lusted, he stole, he concealed, and he lied. And that was me. I did all those four things. And I didn't know who the devil was. The devil didn't make me do it. It was all out of my own 
selfishness. Um, my all of a sudden, my addictive character took over, and as an eight-year-old boy, I was committing a lot of sins, not just one or two, but a lot of them on different different levels. So my parents uh, scolded me, and then they uh, then they went about their business, and I went about mine, and we flash forward in just a couple of years to when I was twelve years old, and I I learned self stimulation and how to mm-hmm. self gratify and got a hold of other magazines and was continued with this behavior uh, all through my teen years and um, uh, into senior high school. Now, I was also uh, became a youth leader in my church, and so I had some leadership responsibilities, and I hid behind that mask, continuing to act out uh, with magazines and myself. Now, I was a bit of a geek, so I didn't really date a lot of girls, and I didn't I was pretty clumsy about dating them so a second or third date with any girl was really out of the question and getting a first date was pretty hard but i i had determined i was going to go to bible college i knew god wanted me to go there i felt like bible college would be the place to go i could meet the perfect girl at bible college marry her and then all this will go away yeah it sounds like well, a great I, plan that, jerry it sounds like a good plan yeah it was <laughs> it was a good plan yeah uh my intentions were pure <laughs> But the poor girl I was trying to marry didn't have that wasn't part of her plan. Yeah, but I think uh, I think you're describing the plan that a lot of guys have in their minds when they're oh, that yeah. age and struggling with that and figuring. Yeah. You know, especially from a Christian perspective, we hear a lot of times growing up we hear this idea of of man all all of these sexual feelings and everything is 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 all bad, and so therefore the only way to make it good is get married, and so we think that marriage is that magic pill that's going to remove all yes. of these all these lies that you just and we use these, scripture to back it up yeah and, and all, it, as if it's it going to re- all saying better to marry than to burn right and and and, and uh, but we we assume it's going to remove all of these sins that were the at the fundamental beginning of your journey which was the lies and the deception and the lust and the stealing you know and we think oh marriage it's going to cure all of my problems, right? So I uh, I did marry the perfect girl, and um, we've been married 46 years. But everything was fine for the first six months during that honeymoon phase. But eventually uh, I started looking for finding, discovering, and going to uh, X-rated bookstores. And these were very popular before the Internet, where there was bookstores sprinkled all over the community. And I'd go to different ones and look at different magazines. Uh, maybe particularly some other other things that went on in the back room, and uh, just continue to waste my time, waste a little bit of money, and uh, just really just got enthralled with it. And then I went to tapas bars. So every time I did something, everything that was exciting yesterday was boring tomorrow. And that's part of the, what uh, the clinical community calls tolerance. I built up such a tolerance that I needed more and more stimulation to get the same effect. Mm-hmm. And then finally, um, I really put my toe in the water and really or basically jumped to the pool when I had my first affair. It was a one-night stand. Um, I lied about my name and what I did for a living and my step- marital status. lied all about that uh, to her. And for all I know, she gave a line to me. And, uh, and that was about an 11-year run of, of just having one-night stands, one, two, three, four a year, maybe more, maybe less. I got involved with prostitutes. And all that, and then this all came crashing down. So I told my pastor this whole sexual history, and about the same amount of time I'm telling you, mm-hmm. uh, in, the, in this radio segment, that uh, I, I had a huge long uh, history. He had been uh, my pastor been reading uh, one of Patrick Hart's first books, Beyond the Shadows, and so um, uh, he had some really wise words for me. He says, "You're above my pay grade. I can't help you." <laughs> so. He sent me to the, see a counselor uh, here in Jacksonville that was well-known at the time as Dean of Christian Counselors. Uh, he since passed away, but I went to see that counselor. He was a tough Marine type, really had the face for it, too, you know, really mm-hmm. rugged. But he's advanced in years. But he diagnosed me in 30 seconds, basically, and I asked him. I said, what's wrong with me? He said, well, you're, you're a sex addict. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't bat an eye. He didn't get flustered about it. He just leaned over and picked up this envelope. This envelope had uh, information about an intensive workshop. And this was 1994 when there was no such thing as an intensive workshop right, back then. Right, exactly. 
I was one of the first ones, and I was kind of a guinea pig along with 14 other guys. And I went to this workshop, and I learned more about myself in less than in, in five days than I'd done in the previous 25 or 30 years. Mm. Uh, I really did some history on me, not just on my sexual history, but a lot of other things about uh, that happened to me. There was there was some uh, some invasion, there was some abandonment by loved ones, and uh, just a ton of stuff. I had a lot of issues to work on. And uh, I didn't uh, realize just how much my life was torn apart or shredded uh, until I went to this went to this workshop and learned about myself. And I was really excited when it was time for us to graduate from the workshop. You don't graduate from recovery, but I didn't want to leave. I wanted to stay there. I, I was one of the last ones to leave because I really I was down in community of, of guys who understood what it was about, and that's that's a very important word I like to use. The word community, because mm -hmm. I was challenged and encouraged by the leader of this intensive workshop to get into a community of other sexual addicts. No matter what their level of recovery is, no matter how many times they've slipped, fallen, or just completely gone on the wagon and binged themselves into tr into, into trouble, you still need to be around other other drunks, other addicts. And so I uh, I joined a 12-step group and. Uh, it took me a little while to kind of warm up to the group, but we did. We warmed up and things went well. But we only met once a week, and that was 23 years ago, but it's still once a week. And it wasn't enough. I needed more community. Uh, we had tried to have two meetings. The second meeting didn't go very well. And then I was just kind of languishing in this 12-step uh, group for a while. And finally, uh, the leader of the uh, intensive said, Jerry, why don't, you, um, why don't you look at starting a support group of your own and uh, – uh, I'll give you the curriculum, and uh, you just buy the workbook, buy the leader's guide, and uh, we'll uh, we'll start these things all over all over the United States, and we'll call them faithful and true support groups. And so um, these were for guys who uh, uh, the doors open for any man who's struggling, but it was primarily geared toward directed towards Christian men in the church who are struggling with sexual sin and mm. some at some level, be it uh, the very very early stages of pornography to the uh, stages of where they violated the law and have to go to jail and anybody in between. Mm -hmm. And so we started that uh, 20 years plus ago. It was 20 years and six months. So when we started, it was my church. We used a room there by pastor's permission. Nobody else knew about it except a couple of deacons or elders in the church probably knew something about what was going on. And uh, we just had this little... Uh, closed Bible study where nobody was invited from our church or, mm -hmm. and, and whatever, but we just kept working on that, and that's kind of where I got to to where we are today where uh, we're doing support groups as a ministry. And, yeah. uh, and it all started with a broken stick or a crooked stick that God made straight. Yeah, so let's, um, I want to I wanna kind of go back a little bit into your story because I think there's some things sure. there that we can draw out. You know, I love the the, the way that you um, you laid out kind of those those four initial sins that were part of just kind of the paradigm that that set up into motion an eventual full blown you know sexual addiction. Um, let's talk about that in terms of of what you've seen over the years in terms of those particular things being so I guess we could say foundational to. Um, to what does eventually become a sexual addiction? Why is it that those four sins, when we think about, you know, lust and then lying and then the the concealing or or deception and then um, the theft and then the theft, what is it about? I mean, is there any particular you know uh, quality to the combination of those elements that seem to create more of a an opportunity or a propensity towards the sexual sin, or is it just, hey, that could apply to any other kind of addictive pattern? Or do you see that there's a quality to those, the combination of those that really exacerbates our propensity towards maybe sexually sexual strongholds? Well, I think it's very important for men and women to realize that uh, as sinful creatures, we don't necessarily uh, camp out on one sin and stay there forever. Uh, we, 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 we sin as the opportunity avails itself to us. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest flaws in, 
in, in, in humankind is they want to blame somebody or something for their behavior. And uh, it would have been very easy as an eight-year-old to say, well, the devil made me do it. Well, I think that's a very flippant, Flip Wilson was the one that first said that, I think, mm-hmm. very flippant statement that, uh, that it is casting off blame and, and projecting blame onto somebody or something else that may be real, that may, there may be some truth to that, but that takes away the personal responsibility that I think needs to occur right away in recovery. And that is identifying uh, character defects, things that are wrong in my life. And generally speaking, when I tell guys to write down every defect you have, I tell them, I encourage them, have your wife sit down with you and have her help you with the list. So I find it very interesting. If a guy writes down three or four character defects, he thinks he's making good progress. His wife will write down 20. Right. And, uh, and, and you ask a friend, a real close friend who you, you may interact with, ask them to write down some character defects. And she, he might write down five or ten more. Mm-hmm. The only one that will write less character defects than the guy is his own mother. Mm-hmm. She will, unless, unless he is really offended his mother in a deep, grievous way. But if he had hidden his sin from his mother the whole time, most moms, my son, can do no wrong. Yeah. And you, you go to death row, death row all over the United States, even foreign countries, we go to death row. By the time a guy gets to death row, the only visitor he has is his mom. Mm-hmm. Can't find the dad, or the siblings don't want to go. Right. And he may may have other relationships, with, uh, but that's just kind of the direction we go. But getting back to this, personal responsibility is what I think helps uh, a guy recover. Because if yeah. he can recover from that, then he can, if he can recognize his faults and default mechanisms, then he can start recognizing what his triggers are. If you recognize the triggers, you identify them early, then the cycle of sexual addiction is stopped right there in its tracks. But let's also talk about the reality that, like, taking even your situation, you know, as an eight-year-old boy, um, you know, well, I'm certainly in agreement with you in terms of the necessity of pers- taking personal responsibility when we, when we eventually get a person that's, you know, an adult and saying, hey, let's talk about your, you know, the patterns that you've got in your life and the decisions that you're making. Um, but would you, would you agree also that there are very real factors that, we're truly outside of our control. Like, for instance, the the stack of magazines that were there, that was somebody else's broken, that's your dad's brokenness that's being dumped into your life without, in other words, you didn't control that, the, the sense that there was something else put into your life that you didn't go willfully bring into your life at that point in time. So how do you address the issue of the very real nature that there is broken, you know, it's kind of like when I think about generationally, all the way back to Adam, every child has had some level of the brokenness of their parents or their community dumped into their lives. And then, of course, we pick up the mantle and we run with it. But how do you address and how did you even address in your own life the reality of the things that were dumped into your life that you did not initiate? Well, I think that's one of the things that intensive counseling be it on a daily, week, on a weekly basis, or a three-day workshop. That's one of the things that I think really can drive home that, you know, there's some things in my life I had no control over. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had a, pers- on a personal level, I had an angry dad, very, very angry. Uh, he drank. Uh, he probably was not, uh, he never admitted to being an alcoholic. He died when he was 55 from cancer, so, mm. but he sure smoked the cigarettes. So he had he had his own level of fault, and some of those invaded me, or uh, offended me. But here's the deeper one. I was six years old, just two years previous to the pornography thing. I was six years old when a neighborhood bully, about six, seven, eight years older than me, probably a teenager, uh, invaded me, and he taught me to take my pants down. He took his pants down, and uh, he had his way with me, and uh, it was icky feeling, it was strange, it was uncomfortable. Um, so I'm six years old and I go home and I try to articulate to my mom the best way I can without revealing too much. I had a, I had a level of shame about it. But I gave my mother enough red flags that mm-hmm. back in 1958 when this happened 
56, 55, somewhere in there, uh, that she should have picked up on it, but she didn't. And so she did, she ignored it. She, and what I felt then was abandonment mm. that my mom did not understand what I was going through. And she passed it off either because she didn't hear me properly or because she heard enough and didn't want to deal with it. Mm. And that's the impression I got, whether it was right or wrong, doesn't matter. It's that's, that's what it was. So, I think one of the one of the insidious things about a recovery that I found early in my recovery was, you always know when somebody invades you, when they invade your space, when they uh, they uh, they uh, they molest you, or they uh, attack you physically, you know those things. But the uh, the uh, abandonment, mm. the feeling of abandonment, is very sinister, very well hidden, and that's what Satan really uses to get into our minds is abandonment. Yeah. That nobody will take care of me but me. Yeah, and so I learned that early on, uh, and it was modeled for me by my mother. And now I look at her whole life, and I found out a lot about my mother after I uh, got into recovery, and I interviewed other family members about my mother, and found out she had a lot of flaws, mm-hmm. but they were well hidden. She didn't talk about them. She didn't. Uh, she admitted that she was a, she was wrong all the time, sinner, whatever you want to call it, but she didn't. She didn't want to really confess her sins to God or receive Christ as Savior. There was no evidence of it mm-hmm. in her life. I didn't have any conclusion. Uh, and so I don't know what, I don't know where she is in eternity, but I know what happened to me. And it's not the six-year-old's fault that he couldn't communicate it properly. Right. It's the mother's job is to interrogate the victim. And I wasn't. And I complained about a lot of different things in my life, and my mother always seemed to ignore them. Yeah. So I'll, I'll show you this one more thing about my family history. So I sat down with my aunt and found out some things. Says, what happened to Grandpa, my mother's father? Uh, oh, he abandoned the family. He left the family uh, during the Depression because he couldn't feed us. So he left Ma, our mom, and there were six of us, six kids. And he disappeared, just left, famished. And so abandonment was taught early on to everybody in my family my mother's family. And then uh, another thing I found out was that my uh, my my aunt, I remember my mother crying and combing her hair, crying and combing her hair because she was getting get married. And she was 15 years old when she got married. And she was pregnant. Mm. Not with me, but with an older sibling. And she married that man and eventually divorced him and abandoned her children, left her children with their father and left the community. And... Um, so there's a lot of abandonment going on there, a lot of a lot of modeling of it. And I'll take you to a wedding. Every time we go to a wedding, my mother would make some comment about um, somebody's wearing white. It's not supposed to wear white except the bride. Or she'd cry a little bit during the wedding. I think it was a flashback for her every mm-hmm. time. Yeah. He used to say, my wedding to my wife was a real shock to my mother. Mm-hmm. She really, it was difficult for her to handle it. She's gone now. I've forgiven her, but doing that family history without blame was a major part of my recovery and really helped me get to a, a level of recovery really quickly. It really accelerated my recovery. It's what my counselor promised me, that you're, if you go to the intensive workshop, you can accelerate your recovery, not overlook anything, but just really blitz through a lot of stuff uh, mm-hmm. in a short period of time and cut down your counseling hours, which are a lot more expensive than a workshop. <laughs> right, Exactly. Well, let me ask you a question, too, because I don't know if, um, forgive me if I didn't uh, recall you saying this in your story, but so at what time, at what point in your, in your story did you come to trust Christ and what was that, you know, kind of navigating all of these issues together as a, as a Christian? Where, where in the story did you come to trust Christ as your Savior? I made a conscious decision when I was nine years old, because all of my buddies in Sunday school and my neighbors down the street uh, responded to the invitation, and they received Christ, and they went down the aisle. And so they went down the aisle, and they kind of drug me down there, too. And then the pastor asked me a lot of questions, and I just did the old head bob, just not out of my head, not out of my head, not out of my head, not knowing that I was going to get back the following week. <laughs> right. So, and, and my dad would have been furious because he didn't want me to get baptized. Mm. But he gave in to it. He, he decided not to make a stink, and he came to the baptism and shook my hand, and one of the few times where I really felt blessed by my father. 
But um, it wasn't until later on when I went, got through uh, a, a semester to a Bible college and married my wife, and we struck out on our own in ministry and whatever. And uh, it was a few months after uh, uh, we had a tragedy in our life and we lost a baby. And I just think that I was really vulnerable. And uh, I felt God speak to me during a, during a once again, a revival, evangelistic service. And this time I wanted to make it straight. I wanted to put a, I wanted to put a stake in the ground and say I'm saved and know I'm saved and mm-hmm. I believe in eternal, eternal salvation. Now, that didn't prevent me from sinning. And that's, thing, that's something that very people don't understand. They don't understand how can you be a Christian to be a sex addict. Well, that's the disease part. That's where uh, men will not shun their responsibility, but will also admit their helplessness and hopelessness uh, in their early addiction cycles and uh, with no help from outside and no, no intervention. And, uh, but, and, and I was that way. I just would eventually default back into what felt good, and that's one of the things I think you teach, and I learned from you and I learned from others, is <clears throat> when we're in, under a stressful or a, hard, or a harmful situation or a reminder a flashback, a trigger, or just a beautiful woman, uh, that we go to the a pleasure center in our mm-hmm. brain, which is very deep back in the back part of our brain, that says you go to sex, you're going to feel better, and you can just kind of forget about your problems. Yeah. And what happens is like an alcoholic or a drug addict, you get high for a while, you get a little buzz, you feel good, you feel excited, uh, and then 15 minutes later, uh, that issue is still there. Right. And you sober up. Well, Jerry, we've and, we've only got a couple of minutes left, and I really would like to, to see if we can get two things done. One is I would love for you to just talk to the person out there who is just kind of on the fence of like, man, they're still they're still hiding, they're still in the dark, and then also would love for you to be able to just give some uh, information about your ministry and let people know how they can uh, learn more about it. Well, I would say that someone that's on the fence that uh, the, if nobody knows, I understand it's hard to come out in the open and say, I've, I've got a problem and I need a lot of help. Not just a little help, but a lot of help. Mm-hmm. And um, I'd also say, don't look for the magic bullet. There isn't one. Yeah. Uh, recovery is a journey. It's not a sport. It's, not a, it's a marathon, you know, not a walk in the park. Uh, it's hard work. I don't want to mince any words and fool anybody, but the re- I would never wish sexual addiction on anybody. But I would never trade the journey I've been on the last 23 years for anything in my life mm. that I've already experienced. Best, best thing, uh, if for anything, I got to meet you, Jonathan. So that's a, <laughs> that's a good part of the journey. Well, you know what? I uh, wanna, my minute. I, 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 I want to make a comment on that too, because isn't it amazing all of the incredible relationships that you gain through recovery that yeah. you never would have had if if you didn't uh-huh. open up about your brokenness and your and your the stronghold. Before my fall, I had a lot of acquaintances and no friends. Yeah. Now I have a lot of friends mm-hmm. and very few acquaintances. Yeah. Um, so tell the, our listeners the, the how other they... other question was about the ministry. Yeah, how can I they get in touch just, with you? Uh, the ministry uh, is, is, is a Jacksonville ministry, but I'm available to speak to anybody that calls and contacts us. So uh, our ministry phone number, our hotline, is 904-443-0246. That's 904-443-0246. Now, uh, for those who would like to uh, go onto our website, and we have a lot of uh, free resources and information there, uh, the, it's a real easy website. Of course, it's www.3w.com, but it's uh, 904true.org. Uh, that's the area code, 904true, T-R-U-E, true, dot org. Very right. simple website. And you can go there, and then you can contact us through that website if you want to. There's connection uh, uh, data, uh, and um, you can contact us that way. Yeah. And uh, those are the two best ways to get a hold of the ministry. I check the hotline once a day, and, uh, of course, the website automatically uh, advises me, someone that wants to connect with me personally. And, of course, if you know somebody in, in the North Florida area that needs our help, you may not be living here, or you may not need the help, but you know somebody who does. You can certainly make the initial call and find out what to do. But I'm going to tell you what to do right now is that they need to call. <laughs> right. Addicts don't get healthy because somebody else uh, makes that phone call for them. They get healthy when they make the phone call themselves. Right. And raise their hands and say, I need help. 
Well, Jerry, thanks for being with us, and I'd love to have you back again to talk a little bit more about just some nuts and bolts of recovery. Would you be willing to do that? I'd love to do that, John. Great. Well, thank you for that. And, and listeners, we're always grateful for you, and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio broadcast.